Transformers are absolutely everywhere, ranging from small ones in consumer equipment and power supplies that you might use at home, uh, to the absolutely huge high voltage transformers uh, that are used in the power grid. And in most cases they are used to transform one AC voltage uh, to another, uh, but they may also be used for different purposes. Now something that's interesting about transformers, and I've actually mentioned this a couple times in previous videos, is the relationship that exists between their physical size, their maximum power output, and the frequency at which they operate. Because it turns out that for a given amount of power, uh, a transformer can actually be made smaller if it operates at a higher frequency. Or, the other way around, uh, for a given size, uh, a transformer is able to handle more power when it operates at higher frequencies. So, uh, for example, uh, in North America, where the power grid operates at 60 Hz, uh, transformers for a given rating are actually a little bit smaller uh, than they are here in Europe, where the power grid operates at 50 Hz. And so, in today's video, we're going to take a look at why that is. Now, here we have a, um, a transformer, a rather big and heavy one, actually, uh, from an old microwave. And the way it works, essentially, is you have two coils in here, a primary coil and a secondary coil. And what happens is, is you apply an alternating input voltage uh, to your primary coil, uh, which then generates a, uh, an alternating magnetic field. That alternating magnetic field then induces uh, a voltage in your secondary coil, uh, and that is the output voltage of the transformer. And because the secondary coil has a different number of turns, uh, or at least in this case and in most transformers, uh, then the primary coil, uh, that output voltage is going to be something different. So in this case, our secondary coil uh, has about 10 times as many turns, uh, so the voltage that comes out of this is about 10 times as much as what you put into it. So, you know, we have uh, about 230 volts going into this thing, and then about, you know, something over 2,000 volts uh, coming out, which is why this is called a step-up transformer. Uh, but more commonly, you'll also find step-down transformers, uh, so the secondary coil actually has fewer turns, and so it reduces the voltage. Now, one thing that is important to realize is that the uh, transformer does not add any power. So the power that goes in is the same as the power that comes out on the other side. At least, you know, there's going to be some losses as well, but let's not worry about that for now. So you'll have the same amount of power going in as you do, you know, going out of it. So uh, this one, for instance, it steps up the voltage, but then you get less current in return. Or if you have a step down transformer, you know, it steps down the voltage, but then on the other side, you can draw more current. So while the voltage and the current might be changed, the power is, is constant. Now, it is also entirely possible to have a one-to-one -one transformer, so it doesn't change the voltage at all. Um, and so that might be done if, you know, you're not really interested in changing the voltage, uh, but you might just want to provide a source of galvanic isolation, right? So you want to electrically isolate your secondary side from the primary for some, like, safety reason, for instance. Uh, so for that reason, you might as well have a one-to-one -one, uh, transformer. Okay, so now what about that frequency, right? So why does the size of this change, or, you know, why does it get more powerful uh, for a given size if I increase the frequency? Uh, so in order to understand that a bit better, I have made um, some uh, a schematic drawing here on my whiteboard. So what we have over here is a, a transformer and in this case, this transformer has a one-to-one -one ratio. So the uh, primary coil has the same number of turns uh, as our secondary coil. Now, you might notice it's a bit of a different style transformer from the one that I just showed you. Uh, so the, the kind of transformer that I have here is like called an EI type because the core sort of resembles the letter E combined with an I. Um, this you might call like an, an O an O core or an, a, a UI or maybe like two square brackets that are facing each other. I don't know. Call it whatever you like. Uh, 
Um, the principle is exactly the same, it's just easier to draw, so that's why it's different uh, from the one I just showed you. So what happens is, you know, when you turn on this transformer, you get this alternating current through your primary coil, and that produces an alternating magnetic flux in the core of the transformer, which I've drawn here as this little arrow over here. Now, if you were to visualize that magnetic flux in a graph, it would look sort of like this. So you'd have time on the uh, horizontal axis and flux on the vertical axis, and so you would see that it changes you know, up and down through time like this. Now, the first thing you should understand about this is that this does not change depending on the load. So let's say I were to close this switch right here, uh, which you know, connects the load to the secondary coil, uh, then of course I'm going to get an electric current through this coil. Uh, and that electric current is going to generate a new magnetic flux of its own. So let's just see if we can draw that in. Kind of like that. However, you know, this new magnetic flux will immediately get a response from our primary coil too. So, you know, we'll start drawing more current from the power supply. And so the primary coil also develops an exactly equal you know, additional magnetic flux. And the result of this is that all of it cancels each other out. And so in the end, we still get the original magnetic flux. So it doesn't matter what we connect to the output of the transformer or just leave it open. Uh, we'll have the same magnetic flux uh, as if the transformer is, is completely unloaded. Now, something that's quite important to realize here is that the magnetic flux must not exceed a certain value because the core of the transformer can only handle a given amount of magnetic flux and if you go past that amount uh, something happens that we call magnetic saturation and that results in all kinds of problems including additional heating and power loss and basically you don't want that to happen in a transformer so you need to make sure that your magnetic uh, flux stays below that maximum value, which depends on the size of the core uh, and the material that it's made of. So the bigger that core is um, and the higher the quality of the material that is used, the more magnetic flux that it can handle before it saturates. So given that we have some transformer core and we know how much magnetic flux uh, is allowed to be in that core how do we make sure that we stay below that value well that is done by picking the correct number of turns on our primary coil because you know so far we've discussed uh, turns ratio so how many turns the secondary has compared to the first or to the primary uh, and vice versa but what about the absolute number of turns right and that is what you need to decide to avoid that saturation from happening. Uh, which is where an equation comes in that looks like this, uh, which is a variant of Faraday's law. And it states that induced voltage, or induced EMF, is equal to minus the number of turns of a coil multiplied by the rate of change of magnetic flux, which essentially means you know, how quickly the magnetic flux uh, changes. So that is super important, right? Voltage is proportional to rate of change of magnetic flux. So if we look at our, our little flot, uh, flot <laughs> our little flux blot over here, you know, where's the rate of change of flux the greatest? Well, that would be, you know, sort of right there, you know, where the slope on our chart reaches its its steepest point that is where the flux changes the most quickly and so that is where our voltage would reach its uh, its peak value uh, so a peak voltage occurs at maximum change of the magnetic flux now given that i have a fixed frequency of this sine wave if i you know stretch the graph vertically like this so i increase the peak flux that also increases that slope. So it also increases the maximum rate of change of flux and vice versa. So peak flux is proportional uh, to rate of change of magnetic flux. And if you bring that back to this equation for a bit, 
then what that tells you is that using a larger number of turns on the coil means that for a given voltage uh, you can have a smaller rate of change of magnetic flux and therefore also a lower uh, peak flux. So increasing the number of turns on your coils uh, for, a, for a given peak voltage reduces the peak flux inside the transformer. So in other words, in order to avoid saturation, you need to make sure that you have sufficient turns. If you don't have enough turns, it's going to saturate. Could you also have too many turns? Well, uh, technically, yes, you could use more turns than necessary, uh, in which case everything will work just fine. You'll just have a peak flux that is, you know, below the maximum amount that you could actually have. Um, but using way too many turns is sort of pointless, right? If you use way more turns on the primary side than necessary, um, you could argue that the transformer is unnecessarily big because the core is operating far away from its saturation point. Or alternatively, you could argue that you've used, you know, a lot of length of extra wire to make all those extra turns. You've had to use a thinner wire, so why would you do that, right? It's not... It's not a practical or effective thing to do. So you also don't want to use way too many turns. Generally speaking, when people design a transformer, they calculate the minimum number of turns they need to avoid that saturation. Uh, and then you add some you know, safe margin on top of that, just to make sure that, uh, that it doesn't saturate. If, if someone applies a voltage that is like a tiny little bit too high, you don't want the transformer to blow up immediately, right? So now we know sort of the relationship between, you know, the peak flux, the rate of change of flux, the number of turns, and, uh, and the voltage. Uh, if you want to know, like, more specifically on how you would go about calculating that number of turns, like, numerically, I'll put up a little document with an example with some actual numbers so you can read along with that if you're interested. There'll be a link in the video description. So now, what about power? You know, how does power tie into all this? What does this have to do with the power of the transformer? Well, um, the maximum power output of a transformer is mostly governed by how much current it can handle, right? Electric current through these coils makes them warm up, produces like resistive heating. So at some point, if you draw too much current, you'll burn up the windings, you'll destroy the transformer. And that sort of determines how much power it can handle. So let's say that we have a transformer that is completely maxed out, right? We're drawing maximum current, uh, so it's operating at maximum power. How could we make this transformer more powerful? Let's say for some reason we need more power. How could we do this? Well, your first thought might be uh, it's an electrical system, so power is voltage times current. So if we can't increase the current any further, what about increasing the voltage? The problem is, if you increase the voltage that goes in, well, your number of turns, whatever it may be, is not appropriate for that increased voltage. So, your peak flux will go too far and you'll saturate the transformer, which is bad. Uh, so that doesn't work. So what about we also increase the number of turns? Well, uh, you could do that, but if you increase the number of turns, you make the wire that is used to make that coil, you know, it gets longer, it needs to be made thinner to fit that number of turns in there, so you can now, you know, can now handle less current. So you've achieved exactly nothing. So clearly that's not it. So there is two options that do work to improve the power output. Option one is to make it bigger, because if you make the core bigger, or you make it out of a more expensive material perhaps, um, it can handle more magnetic flux. And if it can handle more magnetic flux, well, you know, now that means you can increase the voltage or uh, reduce the number of turns for the same voltage and therefore get more power, right? But, you know, we don't like that because that means it gets bigger and heavier. So the second solution is to increase the frequency. Because think about this chart again. If you increase the frequency, that essentially means you're going to squeeze this graph horizontally like this. And that means that this slope, that maximum rate of change of voltage, uh, will get steeper, but this time without affecting the peak flux. So in other words, you know, if you increase the frequency, you can get a, uh, a bigger maximum rate of change uh, of flux, and therefore a bigger 
uh, maximum induced voltage for a given number of turns or use fewer turns and still get the same voltage and you're doing it without actually increasing the peak flux uh, in the core. So now you can get away with using the same size transformer and get more power. So uh, in practice what this means is that if you have a transformer that is designed for let's say 50 Hertz, if you were to run it at 100 Hertz then you could technically run it at twice the voltage and get twice as much power. Or you could you know, use half the number of turns and still use the same voltage but it can now handle twice the current so again twice the power. And so you know, this is why with increasing frequencies you can make transformers uh, more compact. And this actually extends beyond just transformers. This also goes for uh, electric motors and uh, single coils, you know, solenoids, chokes, filters that are used in electronics. Everything, all magnetic components, they get smaller when they operate at higher frequencies. You can make things tinier. Okay then, great. So um, why not change everything over to higher frequencies then? You know, let's just make the power grid uh, operate at a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand hertz. Uh, so that way if, if a transformer fails somewhere, you know, we don't need to call a lorry to bring the new transformer over. We could just send you know, a person on a bicycle to replace it. Wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> I'd surely like to see someone replacing a megavolt amp transformer that is like that big. That would be quite interesting to see happening. But it's not going to happen. And uh, the reason for this is because there is obviously other reasons why high frequency is, is not necessarily always the best option. Uh, there is other things you have to consider. So for example at higher frequencies uh, you're going to have uh, greater eddy current losses, you're going to have issues like the skin effect which is particularly a problem if like for longer distance uh, like longer wires. Um, uh, in electronics, switching losses are a big deal. So if you look at uh, power supplies, right, switch mode power supplies, power converters, they often have high frequency transformers or, or uh, coils in them. Um, and in that case, it's sort of a trade-off. If you're going to operate at really high f a switching frequency, let's say 100,000 hertz, you can make those coils or those transformers or whatever it may be, you can make the magnetic components really small. Uh, but the switching losses of your electronics that are in there are going to, in to increase. So from an efficiency perspective, it's better to switch at a lower frequency, let's say uh, 10,000 hertz. So that way you might have some bulkier components in there, but it's just going to be way more efficient. And so the same thing is true at lower frequencies. So for you know, power grid equipment, for instance, um, yeah, we, you don't really care about the things being bulky, you know, it's all stationary stuff, it's on the ground and getting, you know, high efficiency, etc. Is, is more important, has priority. Whereas in an aircraft, for instance, they, in a, in a lot of cases, use 400 hertz power systems because now all the transformers and motors, etc. can be made much smaller. And of course, saving weight is, is super important in an airplane. So in that case, you don't care as much about the efficiency and it's way more important to have smaller equipment uh, than, it has, you know, than, than to avoid some eddy currents or some skin effect problems. So it really depends on the situation and there is like a compromise to be made there. So there you go, right? That is the uh, sort of the basics on why transformers and other forms of magnetic equipment uh, generally reduce in size as the frequency increases. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you did, maybe consider subscribing to this channel. Uh, and all that's left for me is, of course, to say uh, thank you for watching.